So within the general context of things, if we look around, everything is really a chemical from the fuels that we use to the pharmaceuticals that we have to the materials that we have. Every, all of our things in our lives really revolve around chemicals. And as was just stated a few seconds ago, the vast majority of these chemicals come from petroleum products. So oil and gas has a really large footprint on nearly all the things that we have within our daily lives. And the general central premise of the field of chemical engineering is this idea that we can actually take these type of petroleum products or any type of carbon source and convert that into a product of interest. So really looking at this idea of being able to have an expanded range of inputs for our chemical process, be able to create that process to make new types of products, and in doing so, be able to learn about the engineering design principles implicit behind this. So looking at being able to create flexible platforms, this idea of notion that we call unit operations, the ability to move and expand the types of carbon that we're looking at, and the ability to create new types of products. And in reality, my viewpoint is very similar to this, except for one change. I asked what happens if this factory were a cell instead? What if we can actually internalize these chemical reactions into a cellular system such as a yeast and be able to use that as a factory to convert these resources into new types of products? And this very idea, this premise, is what's called metabolic engineering. And this is really a field that has um, grown over time, no pun intended, um, to be able to look at a new types of molecules. And these are things that can span from pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, fuels, specialty chemicals, and polymers and precursors. Some of these molecules have been extraordinarily successful, being able to be produced at hundreds of grams per liter. Others are mass spec peaks, which generates a promise for being able to move this into an industrial process. However, just adding a certain number of reaction steps into the cell is not sufficient for being able to produce a product. We have to go through this rather large, complex network, this inherent network that really is an intercoordinated, woven network that is a bio-optimization problem. How do we parse ourselves through this complexity of metabolism to generate a process that's efficient? But I'll say that if we're successful in doing this, we can actually move from what is produced in a cell to what can be made by a cell. So what do I mean by that? Well, for really since almost the beginning of time, we've been using cells for being able to produce things like acids and alcohols. And this is really what has moved our food industry as well as our initial chemical industry. With the advent of recombinant DNA technology, we're able to move metabolism from an or um, obscure organism into a host system. And this is really what's been able to make secondary metabolites. These are oftentimes our drugs, things in this example of lovastatin. By beginning the era of synthetic biology, we can actually begin to pull pieces of reactions, pieces of DNA that will encode for these reactions together in non-natural formations and produce molecules that don't naturally exist but yet we can actually create within a system. And then finally, we can envision this frontier of making non-natural products, being able to do chemical reactions that are very dangerous to do, for example, halogenation chemistry, um, being able to do novel polymerizations, being able to do no inorganic material synthesis encoded within a cell. So the promise is, is quite large for what we can do with the system. So within the context of our laboratory, we're really working on this set of tools and paradigms to be able to implement this. How do we actually use synthetic biology to recode things within a cell? How do we use directed evolution to change the way in which proteins and enzymes and pathways work? And then how do we actually pull these together to create a new pathway within a cellular system? So I'm gonna showcase a couple of quick examples of how we view each of these different areas, starting with the idea of synthetic biology, really enabling us to encode at the DNA level the capacity to churn on and off the genes that we want. And if we think about it, how do we turn a gene on and off? Well, this is all genetically encoded. We have a very simple cassette that we can start with. It's as simple and in terms of a conceptualization. We're having a promoter and a terminator to telling us how much to turn that gene on and when to stop that overall transcription rate and ultimately controlling the half-life of that transcript. But how do we actually get that piece of DNA? How do we actually design this in a de novo type of fashion for any host organism we want? Well, we can take a couple of different ways to specify these parts. We can take promise from nature, looking at identifying promoters of interest and then using mutations, this idea of direct evolution, to improve them. We can look at modular construction, or we can ultimately look at this idea of having DNA level specification, meaning we can actually recapitulate what biology is doing in form of some sort of model and be able to design this in silico and then get the synthetic part that we want. 
So just as in a couple of examples of things that we've done in this vein, we've taken bacterial promoters that start off relatively um, weak, and we can actually expand the overall range of expression, as you can see just from um, this fluorescent protein um, GFP that you can see there. We've been able to take combinatorial assembly, so bringing, in this case, upstream activating sequences in a combinatorial fashion together to create promoter ranges that have over a 300-fold mRNA uh, difference on those. And we can actually begin to create models. In this case, it's a statistical-based model looking at a Bayesian um, network to be able to look at nucleosome occupancy to be able to define promoters at that DNA level. So these tools that we have for being able to do synthetic biology are useful for expressing a gene and expressing pathways. But we need to know what pathway to express and how to change that. And a lot of work that we have going on also revolves around this idea of directed evolution, a topic that with the recent Nobel Prize has um, resurged a lot of interest in this overall area. And we've used directed evolution really as a tool to take something at a starting point and move it to where we want it to go for our biotechnological goal. We've done that in examples of looking at xylose utilization, so being able to take xylose, which is an extraordinarily abundant sugar source in biomass, and be able to get cells that can use this uh, sugar at about 135-fold higher rates to be able to produce ethanol from the source. We've also used microfluidic-based systems that I'll highlight in a second to be able to automate this process and speed through and miniaturize the way in which we can do direct evolution and selection. But one of the underlying challenges in this field is being able to associate that genotype and phenotype. And typically, we're looking at these things that are called growth-associated phenotypes. So we can see on there, there's a green cell in that starting point, and that cell grows the quickest. So if we just allow this cell to outcompete the others, we'll have an enrichment of our overall cell, and then therefore we can easily isolate it. However, one of the challenges is that we actually want to make metabolites. We don't necessarily want to make cells that grow faster. How do we actually select for cells that are more metabolically efficient? And oftentimes, those cells grow slower. So to be able to select for which cell produced those red dots, we need a different way. We need to compartmentalize this. Some approaches are looking at the brute, uh, brute force parallelization type of route, which is really just an enormous liquid handling challenge. Our approach that we've decided to take was more of a miniaturization, looking at using high-throughput microfluidics to create oil-water emulsion droplets to be able to essentially trap these cells within these oil droplets, and therefore we can query what amounts of molecule we have in that droplet, and that then becomes the linkage between genotype and phenotype. So essentially we've been able to use these droplet-based systems to physically link our genotype and phenotype in that instance. So we've done that in a number of examples, looking at using this micro-droplet-enabled evolution, being able to encapsulate libraries of cells along with sensors. In this case, it was an rna aptamer based sensor and be able to enrich for cells that were producing more and more of this product of interest um, in a few different examples. So one I'll showcase here is this overproduction of tyrosine. We created RNA aptamers that essentially enable the cell, uh, the, um, this RNA molecule to be able to sense when tyrosine was present. We can look at this on the microfluidic droplet standpoint. On the top, you can see the droplets that have absolutely no tyrosine. There's no fluorescent signal. You can see very clearly the positive control that cell of droplets that contain tyrosine. We see that fluorescent signal. And then you can see a mix of those two different types of droplets. So we can get this discernment between how much of this molecule we're producing in the droplets and our ability to then select for that. So we use that in an iterative set of cycles using directed evolution through a continuous evolution process. And we're able to select for yeast cells that had a 27-fold improvement of the amount of tyrosine that they were able to produce, really looking at the molecules that are being produced within that droplet. So finally, I want to showcase a little bit of the work that we've been doing in terms of making new pathways. So our end goal, as I said at the beginning, is to make new products for cells. So all this work that we have in terms of the tool sets of synthetic biology and the approaches of directed evolution come to a head when we start to want to bring in new capacities within the cells. And we've been working on creating a number of different flexible platforms for products, being able to take, in this case, I showcase one organism. This is a, a, a yeast organism that's called Euroia lipolytica, being able to convert that into a series of nutraceutical compounds, different types of biofuels, monomers, as well as other types of platform acrylic plastics precursors. 
So one example, we spent a lot of time working and engineering this organism that naturally overproduces a little bit of lipids um, to convert that into an overproducer of lipids. So unlike the last presentation where more lipids was a bad thing, here we actually want to produce these lipids because they can be used to convert into oleochemicals or into different types of fuels like biodiesel. So we went through in a very similar type of met uh, metabolic map as we just saw in the previous presentation, going through finding different modifications that we can make and as we do that, we can visualize this improvement that we made taking our starting strain and going to our final strain. As you can see, these little white dots that are on there, that's really the amount of lipid that's produced with the Nile red staining on our starting strain. These cells are about 10 to 15% dry cell white lipid. Our engineered strain, I don't even have to point out where the lipid droplets are because the entire cell is essentially a lipid droplet. And these cells have about 90% dry cell white lipid and are able to really rapidly produce uh, these lipids from basic sugar sources. They produce so much that they actually float to the top of the culture. Um, so we've actually undone all the years of evolution and actually taken a yeast cell that normally would flocculate and get it to actually float, almost like an oil and vinegar salad dressing type of scenario here because these cells become so buoyant there. Uh, so in this pathway engineering, we've been able to take this cell, rewire it, be able to produce these high amounts of lipids. This enabled us to get about 40 grams per liter of these lipids in the course of these bioreactors, and then we're able to extract those lipids out rather rapidly and be able to transesterify them and get a profile of biodiesel that's very similar to that that you would get from soybean-based biodiesel processes. But that's not all. We can actually take that metabolism and rewire it in different ways. We can take that same precursor pool of acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA that went to lipids and convert that into other products. So we're interested in producing molecules like polyketides because they're very interesting for pharmaceutical agents, as well as interesting chemistries that they encode for. Um, so our molecule that we really selected was this molecule of triacetic acid lactone because it's a very simple polyketide to make. It's things that people have been looking at for quite a while in the field. Uh, also because it has uh, basic chemistry that people look at that and you're like, wow, I can do really interesting chemistry with that type of molecule. So we, in, we embarked on this, this uh, mission for about two years. We took this um, Euroia lipolytica cell. We then did a number of different pathway engineering applications as we showed before. We we're able to then convert that into a hyper over producer of this triacetic acid lactone. In this case, getting so much of this tau molecule that it actually became a snow globe in our bioreactors because it precipitated out because it reached that solubility point. We were getting about 36 grams per liter of production and almost 40% conversion yield from sugars on that. So we took this yellowish molecule that we can extract out from this bioreactor and handed it off to a polymer science lab, which is just down the the hall from essentially Nate Lind at UT Austin, and he took that and functionalized it to a clear plastic, this polyepichlorohydrin, and we ended up getting this kind of plastic type material that you can actually see kind of on this film on top of this uh, fiber. And whenever you take something that's yellow and, get some, and add it together with something clear and you get this really represented color, the only thing that comes naturally is to make that into a shape that uh, everyone would recognize. So we took that and made it into a very recognizable shape um, with that clear plastic. So really with that, hopefully I've been able to showcase how we're interested in having the tools to be able to make cells into the chemical factory of the future. We can actually take a wide range of starting inputs, and these are ideally relatively cheap type of carbon sources, and convert those into new types of products, making something that's much more expensive, which actually satisfies our financial balance that you would always want to look at in these types of economic processes. We can use cells in that way that they are built in a modular fashion. We can vary these inputs, and we can actually expand beyond basic catalysis. So really, cellular systems serve as that chemical factory of the future. So with that, I'd like to take a couple of moments to acknowledge um, a number of people who had worked on this, these projects. So over the past 10 years at UT, I've had an um, army of great researchers from 80, over 80 undergraduate students, 25 graduate students, uh, three postdocs, and two visiting scientists who have worked in the lab to really implement these types of viewpoints and visions. The key contributors are listed here for those who actually contributed to the work that I presented, as well as um, to thank our funding sources throughout all these types of projects. And needless to say, thanks to UT Austin for providing all these great opportunities to be able to do this type of extremely impactful work that we've begun to translate into industrial processes. So with that, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Uh, 
Anyone from Shell want to talk about how, what <laughs> your next business is going to be? <laughs> Hi, uh, Alex Lippert, SMU. Yeah. So I'm a synthetic organic chemist, mm -hmm. and oftentimes organic chemists will boast they can make any molecule given enough time and money. Um, it seems like the selection, you have to select molecules that kind of the cells already make, but what's kind of the timeline and prospect before you can make any molecule and I'm no longer sort of needed as a chemist? Well, I, in a way, that's our goal right now. Um, so, so our process um, works in a very similar way as synthetic organic chemistry. So usually we'll take a molecule that we're interested in and use a retrobiosynthetic type of process. So really go back from that end point and link ourselves back to metabolism somewhere, so some central point of metabolism. And the goal then is to try to be able to find the various different enzymes that already encode for that, like I said, finding something that already exists or finding something that's close to existing that we can then use directed evolution to tweak on. Um, so, so it depends a little bit on whether we actually have to go through this enzyme engineering and exploration type of path for the timeline. But most of these processes, so the first ones that have been implemented industrially, the, the classic example is this molecule of 1,3-propane diol produced by DuPont. That took over 10 years and 100 plus PhD researchers to work on to get that into industrial processes. Um, the work that I showcased here, which is a good 15, 20 years removed from, from that initial set of studies from DuPont, is work that can be done by one or two graduate students in the course of, let's say, two to three years, depending on how complex the product is. And this is getting to a point where it now can begin to be licensed out or working with companies to start to do that scale-up process. So I think these timelines are shrinking quite a bit uh, for, for more easily accessible molecules. As you move down the line of what's possible with biochemistry, it becomes a little bit more challenging, but still feasible. Cool. Over here. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, so do you have any, uh, you have fun experiments, so do you have any where you're giving um, an organism, maybe yeast or bacteria, something we don't want anymore, and then trying to make something different with, say, garbage? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we're working on these days is being able to convert plastic waste, which is something that we have completely ruined our environment on um, with respect to kind of these plastic lagoons that, and, and rafts that are sitting out in the ocean and converting those either back into a new type of plastic, one that would be biodegradable uh, ideally, or into new different types of fuels and other chemicals. So I think the, the cheaper the carbon source, the better the process ends up being. So the closer to waste that we really can get, um, the better that it actually is.